Hey, the world hurts. Are you tired of living in a postmodern police state where your thoughts are currency and we're teetering on the edge of moral bankruptcy? It's time to rise up and fight the powers that be, y'all, by visiting your local YMCA, where we'll teach you arts and crafts to take down the tyrannists. The YMCA is your merciless corruption annihilator, and it's where we'll teach you to take down Big Brother and Little Sister. You can make macaroni art to impress the oppressive regime. Paint pictures that'll stir the masses and look pretty dope in your living room. Learn how to swim. Cause that's important. We live in a brave new world. Come on down to the YMCA and try our patented stick it to the man simulator. We have a dystopian fiction book club and we offer fight the powder donuts on Fridays in the rec room. Call 1-800-ARTCRAFT for more information. That's 1-800-ARTCRAFT. Note, the YMCA is not affiliated in any way, shape, or form with the YMCA. Any similarity to the YMCA on the part of the YMCA is purely coincidental and the result of a poorly thought out acronym. The YMCA is not responsible for any radicalization and digestion to fight the powdered donuts that may occur at the YMCA. The constant repetition of the word YMCA is designed to confuse the listener into associating the YMCA with the YMCA. I'm talking about the YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. Fight the power! So I just got back from the YMCA, and while I was there today, I ended up drawing a picture and writing a poem. About a cat. Released in 2000, Jet Set Radio is a 3D action game for the Sega Dreamcast. Developed by Smilebit and released in the US as Jet Grind Radio, the game follows a rambunctious caucus of youths known as the GGs as they travel throughout the city of Tokyoto, compete for turf with other local gangs, and collect pieces to a record that can apparently summon a demon. Yeah, that kinda makes sense actually. Known for its memorable soundtrack, anti-establishment themes, and radical art style, Jet Set Radio was released to critical acclaim, with many game publications going as far as to call it a groundbreaking experience. In the years since its release, Jet Set Radio would go on to inspire games like Insomniac's Sunset Overdrive, as well as the upcoming game by Team Reptile, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. It would also go on to receive a sequel for the original Xbox, an HD port that's available on a number of other platforms, and even a Game Boy Advance conversion. Though that's obviously a different game and won't be getting covered today. So I actually played through this game for the first time about 10 or so years ago when I finally got around to picking up a Sega Dreamcast. While I wasn't that familiar with the Dreamcast's library at the time outside of Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, Jet Grind Radio was actually the first game that I picked up for it, and I ended up falling in love with the game almost immediately. Something in the way this game moves just spoke to me. It attracted me like no other, and aside from making me want to borrow George Harrison lyrics, it genuinely stood out as being one of the most memorable games that I've ever played. But does it hold up? Because being a critically acclaimed and influential game is great and all, but that doesn't necessarily imbue a title like Jet Set Radio with any sort of immunity from the banals of time. And while it was an influential and groundbreaking game for the Dreamcast, it could still very well fall subject to some of the same limitations that befell other great games on the console. Before we continue though, a quick question of the day. What's a game that you're currently playing through or recently beat, and what do you think of it? Be sure to leave your answer to the question of the day over in the comments. I'd love to hear your answer. And if you're new here and are enjoying what you see so far, feel free to subscribe to the channel or something so that you can check out all the other stuff I'll be putting out in the future. And with that out of the way, on with the video. Jet Set Radio is a game that I like to consider Sega at their Sega-ist. It's a fast-paced, arcadey romp that's easy and simple to pick up the basics of, but also encourages players to constantly replay its levels in order to master its mechanics. In a lot of ways, this makes it relatively similar to games like Nights into Dreams or Super Monkey Ball, as those games also have relatively simple premises and gameplay loops that benefit greatly from players taking the time to master them. However, unlike those games, Jet Set Radio's premise and world are just a 
bit more complicated due to its 3D, vaguely open world levels and the objectives that are within them. The average JSR level has you rollerblading through an urban jungle in search of graffiti for rival gangs that you then need to cover with the markings of your group, the GGs. And as you do this, an increasing number of reinforcements will get called in to try and stop you, culminating in a hectic dash to finish tagging your last target before you get unalived by the opposition. On top of that, you'll also recruit new playable members for your gang through challenges that can best be described as a game of horse through traffic. I actually did that once. There was blood everywhere. For the record though, it wasn't all mine. I had ended up plowing into the side of a blood donation truck and... Well, yeah, I think you get the point. And that's really the gist of it when it comes to Jet Set Radio. I mean, there are some race-style challenges you'll need to complete, and these battles that revolve around tagging your enemies as you chase them around in a pseudo-game of, um tag, but the game's premise is relatively straightforward. The same could also be said about its controls too for that matter, as Jet Set Radio's controls skew towards the simple side. You can jump by hitting the A button, which, okay, yeah, that makes sense, and you're also able to sprint by holding down on the R trigger. But while being able to control your movement speed is obviously a nice thing to have in a game like this, and the R trigger is the perfect candidate for such a function, I still think it's a bit strange not to map speed to the analog stick. This is probably just a growing pain that the game was stuck with as a title that was developed in the earlier days of analog control, but that doesn't really change the fact that it feels a bit off. Because of this, things can often feel a little stop and go, and also feel somewhat removed from the sort of momentum-based movement that you might be expecting from a game like this. It also doesn't help that your character's movement speed just feels a bit on the slow side and lacking in excitement because of it. Had this game come out in the modern era, I feel like it would have mapped your standard movement speeds to the analog stick and allowed you to press one of your controller's face buttons to get a small boost in speed, similar to a sprint in just about any other game. As is though, it's fine, I guess. It's honestly just more of a unique little design quirk than anything, and something I usually forget about while I'm playing the game since I just hold that trigger down to begin with. Plus, if you're playing this game with an actual Dreamcast controller, you'll be using that console's pretty awesome analog trigger too, though I guess you'll also get stuck with the Dreamcast analog stick, which is, uh, perfectly functional and not much else in my opinion. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. Actually, that brings us to the next thing I wanted to mention, which is how spray painting graffiti works in the game. Instead of having to type someone's username in or just always hitting a button and seeing your gang sign magically appear on the wall, Jetsa Radio likes to pull you into a short rhythm minigame for some of the larger targets. In it, you'll basically need to play Simon Says and move your analog stick to match these prompts that come up in order to stylishly spray paint a wall. It's a really fun mechanic that's similar to what you might expect from games like Parappa the Rappa on the PlayStation or Space Channel 5, which was also on the Dreamcast, and it's overall a delight to successfully pull off. If I had to be critical though, I can't help but feel like these prompts were just a bit too picky as to how you complete those analog movements on the original Dreamcast release. I get that completing these challenges with some semblance of grace and timing is sort of the point of a game like this, but I still feel like a bit of leeway would have gone a long way in helping the game feel better to play. And I know, I know, I should just man up and get good or whatever. But no. After all, I'm not even saying that it's bad or anything. If I had to compare it to anything, I'd say it's kinda like trying to do special moves in a Street Fighter game with an analog stick as opposed to a D-pad or arcade stick. Like, yeah, it works, but it's not exactly optimal. Either way, the HD remaster actually seems to have fixed this, as during my playthrough on PC, I didn't run into nearly half as many issues trying to input graffiti commands as I did on an actual Dreamcast or a Dreamcast emulator. However, because of the issues I did have with my inputs on the Dreamcast version, I can't help but wonder what it would have been like if the game defaulted to using the D-pad for its tagging challenges. I understand that the analog stick was used so that you could pull off large sweeping movements that are supposed to simulate the way a person's arms would swing as they sprayed a wall with graffiti and all, but it would have helped with the precision needed in these challenges and made things feel more like inputting commands in a 2D fighter or playing a rhythm game without a dance mat. Which actually sounds like a really fun input option in and of itself. Huh. 
Anyway, that was just an idea I had in passing and doesn't actually detract from what I think of the graffiti mechanic in and of itself. I do have to point out that the levels that revolve around chasing and tagging rival gang members can be pretty rough though due to the pitifully limited range of your spray paint and the game's very sensitive hit detection. I'm also not a fan of the fact that the left trigger controls both camera resetting and your spray paint. In practice, it just makes these challenges really annoying and a little overstimulating for my liking. Moving on though, the game adds a tiny bit of depth to things by forcing you to stockpile cans of spray paint that are scattered throughout each of the stages. It's a nifty little idea that at best encourages you to explore the stages a bit in order to get a lay of the land, and at worst, it artificially inflates the length of those levels by introducing backtracking. All in all, Jet Set Radio's structure is, as I've said multiple times already, relatively clear cut and greatly emphasizes repeated playthroughs. While it does allow you to do the simplest of tricks and other fun things like grinding on rails and raging against the machine or whatever, these mechanics are all exceedingly surface level and don't even begin to try and emulate the trick systems and physics of a game like Tony Hawk Pro Skater or the oft-forgotten Kelly Slater's Pro Surfer. Yeah, remember that game? Neither do I. Even though I've been known to casually and poorly enjoy a round or two of something like Tony Hawk Pro Skater or Underground in the past, there's no denying that those games both have a relatively high learning curve for newcomers. And despite the fact that that's all well and fine, I can't help but feel like the inclusion of that would have diluted what makes Jet Set such an easy game to recommend to people. However, something about the movement in this game just doesn't click for me. While it isn't bad in and of itself, it never quite feels as fluid as I'd like it to and can sometimes feel relatively imprecise. This isn't helped by the game's camera either, which can often be a bit too finicky for its own good and make landing on rails or platforms a lot harder than it probably needs to be. Because the Dreamcast didn't have a second analog stick, the original release lacks the sort of camera controls that would have been needed to comb over some of these issues. It's still playable and actually quite good for what it is in most cases, but it's definitely an issue that most players will run into if they go with the Dreamcast release. For what it's worth though, you do get to control the camera on the remaster, and man oh man does it make all the difference. Seriously, I was about two thirds of the way through the game on the Dreamcast when I decided to pick up the PC release since 70% of my purchase was going towards cancer research, and I ended up replaying the entire game this way. However, in spite of its issues, I can't help but find Jet Set Radio's gameplay extremely charming, regardless of which platform you end up playing it on. Even at my pitiful, clumsy level of play, rolling through these stages is an absolute blast that's bolstered by the sights and sounds of Tokyoto. Each of the game's areas are rife with police and military that are out for blood, and there's something unbelievably fun about slipping and sliding past them as you dodge their gunfire. Also, I'm convinced that the head policeman in this game is a riff on Columbo from TV in the 70s, and that's just awesome. So yeah, that's a thing. You can even straight up murder helicopter pilots by blinding them with spray paint and forcing them to crash. It's actually really violent in hindsight, but uh, hey, I mean, they're the ones treating graffiti like it's a crime worthy of lethal force, so, you know, an arm for an army or whatever. Adding to the outright thrill of the gameplay is the game's phenomenal art style, which combines slick, cel-shaded graphics with loud and bombastic graphic design, a wonderfully anime aesthetic, and heaps of overly exaggerated animation. It's a total beast of an art style that taps into youth culture from late 90s Japan and encapsulates that scene in a vibrant and campy world that genuinely feels full of life. Skating through traffic like your Jackie Chan in Winners and Sinners, or bursting through a building like your Ferris Bueller is a total joy, and even though I think that Jet Set Radio doesn't exactly have the greatest sense of momentum in its gameplay, I do believe that the game's visuals benefit because of this through remaining clear and easy to follow. While the original game still looks quite good when played at its native resolution, upscaling this game on an emulator or playing its HD remaster really allows these visuals to shine, in spite of some poorly upscaled textures and some visual pop-in issues that are a bit more noticeable now thanks to the resolution bump. 
And even though these character models are every bit as 128 bit as they were back in 2000, they look like they haven't aged a day when displayed at as high as 1080 or 1440p, and the artistic choice to use cell shading to emulate the look of 2D animation remains an absolute delight to look at. Even the kinda clumsy dance animations that each of the characters have are an absolute joy to watch. Have they aged well compared to what we got these days? Well, no, not in a traditional sense, but they have a lot of character and charm to them that makes them hard not to adore anyway. The only gripe I have with Jet Set's art style is that, in being so generally exaggerated and stylized, it can sometimes rely on some general racial characterizations that, well, they aren't exactly in great taste, and they kinda sully an otherwise perfect visual presentation for me. Overall though, the general feel of Jet Set Radio's animations, camera style in its cutscenes, and its generally radical aesthetic give off a total MTV meets anime vibe, and it's so awesome. And speaking of MTV, Jet Set Radio might have one of the best soundtracks to ever make its way into a video game. Seriously, if you haven't heard this game's music before, it has some of the catchiest and funnest songs that I've ever heard. With a few notable exceptions, I don't usually listen to video game music outside of its original context, but Jet Set Radio's music has consistently been one of my go-tos whenever I'm in need of a quick pick-me-up. I think this is at least in part due to the music being made to encapsulate a real scene in Japan from the time, and that because of this, the music has a wider appeal than simply being pleasant to listen to while you're playing through the game itself. At any rate, it's an insanely playful and varied soundtrack, combining elements of hip-hop, garage rock, and funk with an effortless and in-your-face coolness that screams the late 90s and early 2000s in the best way possible. Even if you aren't a huge fan of any of those genres, I'd still say that the soundtrack is worth giving a shot, even in isolation. At the risk of sounding like a Pitchfork review, I think it simultaneously feels comfortable and familiar to a listener, while also managing to feel like a wholly unique experience. It's all just so stylish, and honestly, that might be the best way to describe Jet Set Radio as a whole. It's an insanely stylish game first and foremost, with some solid arcade gameplay to back it up. While I do wish the game had a bit more depth to it, or an optional and admittedly ridiculous DDR-style input option like I mentioned earlier, that's all the game really needed to be, and it knows that. So does Jet Set Radio hold up? Yes. Jet Set Radio does not take itself seriously at all, nor do you really want it to. It knows that it's got an addictive enough gameplay loop for a wide audience, as well as an aesthetic that's becoming of an anime like Fooly Cooly and proudly waves its freak flag as such. While the original Dreamcast release can feel a bit rough around the edges these days, it's still got a lot of charm and may be worth checking out if you've got a Dreamcast or are curious about the original gameplay experience. Otherwise, I can't stress how good its HD conversion is. The PC release of Jet Set Radio is dirt cheap, runs on just about anything, and makes some quality of life changes that, while few in number, are really appreciated. Playing through Jet Set Radio again was a lot of fun for me, and now that I've basically beaten it twice in the past couple of weeks, I'm genuinely thrilled to give its Xbox sequel a shot in the near future. I'm also really curious about getting to play Bomb Rush Cyberfunk when that finally launches on Nintendo Switch sometime this year, as that game is, for all intents and purposes, the third Jet Set Radio game. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. Feel free to like, comment, or subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it, and feel free to leave an answer to the question of the day down in the comments if you haven't already. On top of that, you're more than welcome to support the channel via donation by following the Buy Me A Coffee link in the description or pinned comment, or to follow me on social media by looking up at NichePlays on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find links to those in the description. And if you aren't sick of my voice yet for whatever reason, you can also check out my retro movie and TV review podcast, Media Obscura, on your podcast player of choice. We're about 90 episodes into the show, we have a huge back catalog to go through, and we're back and doing bi-weekly episodes, so check it out if that sounds like something you might enjoy. So yeah. Bye.